Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. One word that uh, you find in the Bible quite a bit when you look for it is the word remember. Because memories are special. Uh, Memories can be a wonderful way to learn and, and a wonderful blessing. And of all the memories we have in life, Christmas memories are some of the most special. And I think that uh, this particular service is a wonderful way to make a Christmas memory. It's a great opportunity to focus on the Lord and to worship Him, to know Him better, and also to create a memory that He can use to bless you for years to come if He tarries. Tonight at the end of the service, we will uh, use the candles, and I'll give you some more instructions when the time comes for that. Uh, Just a word, parents, we'll let you decide uh, which children get candles and which don't. And uh, we will move into place when the time comes, and I would suggest that uh, you do that as a family so that you can help your children with their candles. For right now, I invite you to take just a few moments during the prelude to focus on the Lord to uh, prepare in mind and heart and get ready to worship Him. Let's pray together. Father, we ask tonight that you would guard us from the danger of allowing the Christmas story to just become commonplace. We have had the opportunity to hear it so often, which is a wonderful privilege, but it also brings with it the danger of uh, taking it for granted, uh, of missing the wonder and the awe and the message that are held in every little detail of the fact that... uh, The Lord Jesus Christ stepped into our world in Bethlehem. 
We ask that tonight you would guide each of us to really encounter you. Lord, help us to hear from you. Guide us to seek you and to be open as you speak to each of us. And Father, help us to know the wonder and the message of the Christmas story in greater and deeper ways than we ever have. And it's in the name of the one who came and laid in that manger as a baby that we pray. Amen. If you would please turn in your hymnals to responsive reading number 141. Responsive reading number 141. Please stand. I will read the light print if you will follow by reading the bold. And the word became flesh and lived among us. John testified to him and cried out, From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. No. If you'll please turn to hymn number 110. On this Eve Eve of our Christmas celebration, Jesus' birthday, we light all of the candles of the Advent wreath. First, we light the candle for hope because Jesus is our hope. Secondly, we light the candle for peace because Jesus is our hope and peace. Third, we light the candle for joy because Jesus brings joy. Fourth, we light the candle for love because Jesus is love. Finally, we light the center candle. This is the Christ candle. Jesus is born, Jesus has come, and Jesus is our salvation. In the book of Galatians, the Bible says, But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Let's pray. God of love and light, we thank you now for the light of that star over 2,000 years ago that guided the shepherds and the wise men to that holy baby. 
Lead us now by the light of your love so that we can follow you to new life in him. In celebration of the birthday of our King and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be took of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Je Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth to, in Galilee to Judah, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came, came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. If you'd please stand and turn in your hymnals to hymn number 148, hymn number 148.
in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 2. The scripture says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And then a little farther down it says, When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. All of your life and all of my life, we have seen nativity scenes at Christmas time. We've seen them in front yards and we've seen them on church lawns. In fact, you saw a beautiful nativity scene if you came in our front door tonight because we have one this year in front of the church. We've seen them on billboards and in television commercials. We have nativity scenes or nativity sets around the house. They come in every size and shape. They are made out of everything imaginable from plastic to wood to porcelain to styrofoam. Some of them are inside of snow globes. Some of them are real people in a living nativity out in the church lawn. I have one very small one that is carved out of olive wood that came from Bethlehem. I have seen some that were so expensive that I could not have bought a baby lamb if I wanted to, much less a wise man or baby Jesus. And I also have three of my very favorites that are tiny plastic ones that I bought years ago for a grand total for all three of less than a dollar. We have seen nativity scenes all of our lives. In fact, we've probably seen them so often that normally we just don't pay very close attention to them. They just start to blend in, don't they, with all of the Santa Clauses and all of the Christmas landscape. So tonight I'd like to stop for just a few moments and look just a little more carefully. Uh, let's notice some of the particulars that make up a nativity scene, some of the features that the Bible tells us about, some in the passage that Lakeland read, some in that passage in Matthew. They're features that are usually a part of every nativity set, no matter what it's made out of or how much it costs. First of all, focus for just a moment on that star up above the stable. Matthew tells us that God commissioned a particular star to serve as a kind of GPS for the wise men. They didn't have Google Maps. They didn't know how to find the baby Jesus. And so God commissioned a particular star to guide them to the right location. That star led them to Jerusalem, and then it led them to Bethlehem, and then it led them to the exact location of Joseph and Mary and Jesus. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about exactly what that star was and just how it worked. But the most important point about that star, as we read about it in Matthew, and as we look at it in the nativity scene, the most important point is not which heavenly body it may have been or exactly how it worked. The most important point about that star is what it tells us. And that is, God provides help for people who are really looking for him. Matthew says the wise men rejoiced when they saw the star. They celebrated the fact that God had provided them with a remarkably accurate travel guide. Uh, the wise men knew even after they got to Jerusalem, they were not going to find Jesus without that star, but God had provided it. That Christmas star was God's gift of direction. It was God's travel guide for people who were looking for him. The star reminds us that God always provides help for people who really want to find him. He's done that all down through history. Uh, God has always seen to it that people who earnestly seek Jesus will find him. Uh, that night in Bethlehem, a mile down the road, 
In fact, over next door at the end, they missed the whole thing because they just weren't interested. Uh, they were just wrapped up in what they were doing and in other things. But for those men who were from several nations away who really wanted to come and bow down before the king, God provided a light that brought them right into his presence. If you really want to know Christ, if you really want to come to him, God will give you direction. He will put stars in your life to help you find him. In fact, the truth is, if you are a Christian, I'll just bet that you can look back and see how God provided stars in your life, travel guides at just the right time to bring you to himself. Sometimes those stars that he puts in our lives, sometimes those travel guides that he gives us are people. When I was nine years old and I was ready and willing, God sent along a pastor who, along with my parents, led me to Jesus. Uh, when I was in high school and trying to decide what in the world to do in life and fast slipping away from the Lord and the church, God sent along a youth minister who pointed me to Jesus. Uh, sometimes God draws us to his word in the Bible. Sometimes he speaks in that still, small voice in our hearts. He might do it in any number of different ways. But that star up there at the top of that nativity scene reminds you that he will do it. Uh, if you really want to come to Jesus, then he will provide the directions that you need. Uh, it may not be an awesome display up in the nighttime sky. It may be a person or a, a desire or a situation or his word or that still small voice, but God will provide you with the stars, with the direction that you need. The star tells us that God gives direction to those people who really want to find him. And then it also shows us that if you follow the light that you have, God will give you more light. If you read the story in Matthew carefully, you discover that the star appeared to the wise men. It pointed them toward Jerusalem, and, or toward Israel, and then toward Jerusalem. And then it disappeared. Uh, they got to Jerusalem. They went to the palace. They talked to Herod. And then they rejoiced to see that the star had reappeared so that it would lead them on further to where they needed to be. If they had never followed it the first time that it appeared, they would never have seen it the second time, would they? Uh, it was only after they had followed it as far as they could see that God gave them the light to see farther and to go farther. Follow the light you already have. Do what you know God has already called you to do, and then God will give you more light. Tonight, when you go out after this service and you get ready to drive home, when you turn on the headlights on your car, more than likely they are not going to shine all the way to your house. So how do you get home through all of that dark? Well, the answer is you drive up as far as you can see. You drive up as far as they do shine, and lo and behold, they shine a little farther then, don't they? And if you drive up that far, they'll shine a little farther. And if you continue that process, they will take you all the way home. And that is how it works with God. Do what he's called you to do. Follow the light he's already given you, and he will give you more. But if you haven't followed the light that you already have, why would he send you more? Follow the star to Jerusalem, and then just see if it doesn't reappear and lead you right on to Bethlehem and right to where he wants you to be and where you need to be. The star tells us that God gives direction to people who want to find him. He always puts stars in the lives of people who seek him. And he can even use you to be a star in the life of somebody else. And if you follow the light that he's given you, he'll give you more. Looking at that nativity scene in your mind's eye now, as we think about those particulars, turn your focus down just a little bit from the star and let's look at 
the staple, that old wooden staple. We thought about it a little this morning, but there is so much more to learn. The real thing, uh, I'm sorry, probably just was not as cute as the one in that Precious Moments Nativity set. It was like a thousand other stables. It was rough and splintery, and it was crowded with smelly animals, dark and damp and infested with rodents and insects and who knows. All of which makes you wonder, if God commandeered a star to lead the wise men, why did he not commandeer a suite at the Bethlehem Hilton? Or at least a clean private room with the doctor. Uh, the star is a much bigger feat than that would have been. Well, the answer is God could have, but he chose not to. God chose the stable for his son to be born in for a very important reason. That stable tells us that God sent Jesus to live in the real world. When God sent his only begotten son to live on this earth, he made a strategic decision not to shelter him from the harsh realities of life. As a baby, Jesus' first breaths included the scent of manure. The first noises he heard were the grunting of livestock. If you're a parent, remember how you decided to spend all that time trying to decide which little outfit to put on them first, right after they were born, or which little outfit to put on her or on him to bring them home from the hospital. Jesus's first little outfit was the equivalent of dust cloths. From day one, God made the decision, he determined not to shelter his son from the rude, crude realities of life on earth. Not too many years ago, the world watched while the people of Romania stormed the palace and threw out a dictator. For 24 years, he had made them exist on a diet of cabbage and virtually nothing else while he lived in absolute splendor and ate the finest food in the palace. And finally, they stormed the palace, threw him out. They destroyed all of his possessions, and the whole time they were chanting, you're not one of us. You have no idea what we're going through. Well, take a good look at that stable and that nativity set. That stable is a permanent reminder that God sent Jesus to live in the real world. He knows what you're going through. He had a humbler beginning than any of us. He was born into a real family, lost his father more than likely at an early age, and he worked at a construction job for 30 years. He lived in a neighborhood. He had real friends. He suffered hardship probably beyond any of the rest of us, and worse, he died a cruel death for a crime he didn't commit. So when you look at the Savior, who has now ascended to the right hand of God, you and I can do that with the assurance that no matter what you're going through in life, he's been there and he understands. Life without advantage, he lived it. Shortage, poverty, he's been there. Discrimination, oppression, he was a refugee before he was one year old. Abandonment by his closest friends. Rejection, ridicule, that was part of his daily life. Death of loved ones, multiple times. Physical pain, more than you and I are ever likely to experience. Look at that stable and remember this Christmas that Jesus understands. He's been there. He can identify with you no matter what you're going through. And what's more, you matter more to him than you can possibly imagine. That stable symbolizes the deliberately unsheltered life of Jesus. 
It stands as a monument to his ability to identify with and sympathize with you. This is a savior who will pay any price. He'll be born in a stable. In humbler circumstances than any of us, he will walk on water. He'll endure the righteous wrath of his father. He will show up wherever life leads you, and he will not be indifferent to the challenges and the difficulties and the perplexities and the hardships that you run into in life. You matter to him, and so God sent him to live in the real world just like you do and worse. Well, we've looked at the star and the stable, so now just for a moment in our nativity set, take a look at the manger. As most nativity sets portray, the manger was not a first century bassinet. It was a far cry from that. A manger was really nothing more than a feed trough for cattle. It was a roughly built piece of barn furniture, ordinary in every way. If you think about it, really the only reason you and I have ever even heard of a manger is because Luke says that Jesus was born in one or laid in one after he was born. Uh, we all know what it is, but when did you ever hear the word manger outside of the Christmas story? Uh, apart from that, we wouldn't really even have a clue what one was. But because God's son was laid into one, we all know what it is, and look what happened to that ordinary piece of barn furniture. All of a sudden, it has a whole new dignity. All of a sudden now, it's a household word. Most of us have little models of them sitting in our houses every December. The ordinary has become extraordinary. In fact, a feed trough for cattle has become the cradle for a king. That's uh, quite a transformation, wouldn't you say? The manger is a symbol of what happens to an ordinary man or woman when Jesus comes inside. It's a symbol of what has happened to thousands of ordinary people around the world and down through the ages. Just ordinary, average, run-of-the-mill, working people. Uh, thinking, relating, acting, until one day they saw themselves for what they really were. Sinners in the eyes of God. And those ordinary people bowed before the Lord in repentance and in faith. And they gave their lives to Him so that the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ came inside. And when Jesus came in and took up residence by his spirit, that ordinary life became extraordinary. Just like a feed trough became a king's cradle, an average, lost, sinful, guilty man or woman becomes an adopted son or daughter and a member of the family of God. Where once he was just living for himself, where once she was self-absorbed, just living for herself, now they become exceptional in love and thoughtfulness and generosity. Jesus still does to human beings what he did to the manger. He makes something that was ordinary, extraordinary. Wherever you go at Christmas, you're going to see nativity scenes. And when you do, Pause for just a second and look at the star and the stable and the manger and listen to the message that they share. God gives direction to those people who are looking for him. He sent his son to live in the real world and he turns the ordinary into the extraordinary. And it all points to that one great fact. He loves you and he's ready to save you. Before the nativity scene, you really have a simple choice. You can just let another one go by and blend into the Christmas landscape, or you can follow the light that God gives you. You can find the Savior who loves you and understands you, 
and you can fall before him in repentance and worship. Your choice. Let's bow together. Take just a few moments in your heart to spend with him in prayer. Share with him whatever you need to share and listen as he speaks to you. Father, we ask tonight that you would guide us this Christmas, not just to celebrate the season, but Lord, guide us to see the truth that's written into every detail of the story, the salvation that comes through your Son, the one who stepped into the world at Bethlehem, gave himself for each of us on the cross, and conquered death so that we might too. Father, guide us this Christmas to be sure that we know him, really know him in a way that saves us and brings honor and glory to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask. Amen. Tonight for uh, the candlelight portion of the service, we are going to uh, stand and form a circle around the outer walls of the sanctuary. So uh, if you would, find your candle. And we can provide one if you missed it on the way in. And if you would, take just a moment or two to go ahead and slip quietly and quickly out. And let's form a circle around the outer walls. We'll extend it into the back and to the sides if we need to to make room. In the Gospel of John, the scripture says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In just a moment, we are going to take the light from the Christ candle and share it around the circle with each other as you pass it to your neighbor. That symbolizes the light that only comes from Jesus and how God gives us the privilege of sharing that with each other. And then following that, we're going to sing before we blow out our candles. 200 years ago tomorrow night, On Christmas Eve of 1818, there was a church in Austria that prepared to celebrate a Christmas Eve service when disaster struck. The organ broke. And that scuttled every piece of music they planned to use in that service. So the pastor took a poem that he had written and almost forgot about. He gave it to the minister of music who composed some music on the guitar so that they could sing it, and they sang it that night. The man who came to repair the organ found it 
and began to share it with other churches. They loved it, and it has been a beloved Christmas hymn ever since. And that is how the Lord gave us Silent Night. It came about because of what at first seemed to be a disaster. And isn't that just like God? So tonight we will pass the light, and then we'll sing Silent Night before we extinguish the candles.
makes quite a difference when we take our light from Jesus and then share it with each other in what was a dark place, doesn't it? You may extinguish your candle. Matt, if you would let there be light. We pray you a Christmas of family and joy and most of all of Jesus. And you are dismissed. Good night. Thank <clears throat> you.